voice of the Vatican. The Holy See spokesman responds to critics who question the timing of the Pope's big announcement on the death penalty. Chance at history. A pro-life advocate and ally of President Trump has a shot at becoming the first woman from Tennessee elected to the Senate. Focus on families. Pope Francis tells the world what he's praying for this month. And Franciscan feast. Peruvians feed thousands of people in honor of the feast of the Porti Uncola. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, August 3rd, 2018. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. The Vatican is denying it released the revised catechism on the death penalty to deflect attention from the sex abuse crisis that is rocking the Catholic Church. Capital punishment is now called inadmissible. Critics say it's a diversion from reforming the Church. Tonight, we have reaction from the Holy See. We start our coverage with Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley. Wyatt, earlier today I spoke to Greg Burke, the Vatican spokesman, and he rejected criticism of the timing of this revision. Uh, Greg Burke highlighted the fact that Pope John Paul II called for the end of the death penalty years ago. And I asked him how the Holy See will now be working with governments to abolish the practice around the world. The Holy See will get the message out. That is what uh, the Pope's strength in this is. It made a lot of news, obviously, even though we had been waiting this, for this for a while. If you look at this, this is Pope Francis completing something begun by John Paul II in the Gospel of Life. I think it was very clear what direction we were going in, and now it's become official. You know, it's interesting that he has visited prisoners, but can we expect the Pope or the Holy See to go knocking on doors of governments trying to get them to change their stance at a much higher level? The Holy See's way is soft diplomacy. Okay, it's soft diplomacy, it always has been, it's the long game, and it will continue that way. I'm wondering, does the Pope now want faithful Catholics in countries where the death penalty is still legal? Does he want them to change their stance on the death penalty and officially oppose it? Well, I think it would be interesting to take a look at Catholics in the United States, for example, over the last couple decades, with the gospel of life and with John Paul II, who was so strong on the culture of life, many people thought, well, that was anti-abortion. Wow. Certainly was anti-abortion, but it was also anti-death penalty and pro-life in general, elderly people, euthanasia, that kind of thing. John Paul II really started to change the culture, I think, within the church as well. That is important, and that should not be underestimated. What the Holy See said yesterday is the church will work for the ab abolition. Now, I think that's up to individuals to do as they want to do. There's some Catholic groups that are very active in that. We understand that the Pope actually decided on this revision in May, but you announced it three months later. So how do you respond to those critics that are perhaps implying that the timing was chosen to deflect attention from the current sex abuse crisis and specifically to Cardinal Theodore McCarrick's resignation? My answer to the critics is I'm not a great believer in conspiracy theories. Uh, there are a lot of people in Italy who are. I, obviously, there are obviously some in the United States who are as well. I'm not really big on conspiracy theories. Things take time in the Holy See. The last rescript, this was technically called a rescript that was put out, also came out several months after it had been signed by the Pope. So you can think of all the great theories you want. I'll just tell you that the Polish translation was not finished until yesterday. And uh, the Latin one, I think, just was finished this morning. So you see the Vatican spokesman clearly defending the release of the updated point of, cat of catechism on capital punishment at this time. And other Vatican officials are backing the Holy Father up as well. Archbishop Rino Fisichella, head of the Vatican's office for the new evangelization, calling it true progress in continuity with previous church teaching. Julia, can we expect Pope Francis to continue pushing on this issue? Well, that's an issue that's obviously very important to the Holy Father, Wyatt, and that's clear. And as Greg Burke said, he's made a lot of news, and he can get the message out there. Now, the faith will have to digest it, and that could be a struggle for some. Right now, the Vatican is gearing up for the world meeting of families in Dublin, Ireland in late August, and we can't predict if the Holy Father will address the death penalty there but we can predict, Wyatt, that journalists will be questioning him on it. Vatican correspondent Juliet Lindley reporting from Rome. Thanks, Juliet. Thank you, Wyatt. 
Catholic leaders in the United States are also reacting. Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles welcomes the changes to the catechism and says he's grateful to Pope Francis for his leadership. But he says, quote, the catechism is not equating capital punishment with the evils of abortion and euthanasia. This shift could have an impact on lawmakers across the country. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York says he will now introduce a bill to remove the death penalty from state law. Cuomo remains a strong supporter of abortion. Nebraska is also wrestling with the issue. Its bishops are calling on the state to halt an upcoming execution, cited yesterday's announcement by the Vatican. In a statement, they write, simply put, the death penalty is no longer needed or morally justified in Nebraska. Nebraska's Republican governor, Pete Ricketts, a Catholic, has said in the past that he supports capital punishment. Joining me now from Omaha is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, an expert in Catholic social teaching. Deacon Gutierrez, welcome to the program. The revision of the catechism comes at a time when Nebraska is facing its first execution in more than two decades. Why are the bishops getting involved? Well, they're getting involved uh, because they're fulfilling their obligation as, as bishops to govern, to sanctify, and to teach, to teach the faith. And uh, we have a situation here in Nebraska, and the bishops are simply living out their call. Well, Governor Ricketts, a Catholic, as I mentioned, has been a leading advocate for restoring the death penalty in Nebraska. In 2015, he actually vetoed legislation that repealed capital punishment. And when the state's legislator override, overrode his veto, he helped fund a ballot measure that reinstated it. So what is he saying to the bishops? Well, his response uh, yesterday especially was um, that he needs this as a tool to protect his guards and to protect the, the public safety. Um, but to my knowledge, he hasn't given any real reason for that, particularly in light of the upcoming execution schedule of a, of a man who poses no danger to his guards or to the public safety. Well, do you see the effort to end executions in Nebraska as a practical response to Pope Francis' action? In a certain sense, although in truth, the bishops have been saying the same thing for decades now. Um, several bishops have been preaching against the death penalty as they assess the current situation here in Nebraska and have said, look, it just isn't applicable here at this time and we shouldn't be using it. Well, some critics are asking if the renewed focus on the death penalty is a distraction from the reform that many say need to take place in the church. What's your take on that? Well, I, I think we all agree a reform needs to take place. But that having been said, you know, the bishops here in Nebraska certainly have no control over what the Holy Father says. And the Holy Father, I think he said this on the 20th, 25th anniversary of the catechism. So that has its own timing. And the bishops are just here in Nebraska responding to the situation on the ground here. Okay, very good. Well, I know this is an issue that Catholics across the country and across the world are continuing to pray about. Deacon Omar Gutierrez, author and expert in Catholic social teaching, coming to us from Omaha. Thanks so much, Deacon. My pleasure. Thanks. A White House official defends President Trump's handling of the Russia investigation. Mercedes Schlapp, the director of strategic communications, says the president is sending a clear message. We want to make sure that every vote is cherished, that we're uh, ensuring that the states have what they need to ensure that there's no foreign, foreign influence in this election. Does President that? Trump has been tougher on this issue than any previous administration. Are you Schlapp tells EWTN News Nightly President Trump directed the administration to be tough in May of 2017 and to strengthen and review cybersecurity measures. Still, the president continues to question the Russia investigation while speaking to supporters in Pennsylvania last night. Now we're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax, okay? I'll tell you what, Russia's very unhappy that Trump won. That I can tell you. President Trump defends his outreach to Russian President Vladimir Putin and derides the investigation that has plagued his campaign. But the attack on America's 2016 presidential election is real, according to all five officials who appeared at Thursday's White House briefing, including FBI Director Christopher Wray. This threat is not going away. As I have said consistently, Russia attempted to interfere with the last election and continues to engage in malign influence operations to this day. President Trump also rails against what he calls the fake news media. He singled out the press several times last night. Whatever happened to fair press, whatever happened to honest reporting? They don't report it. They only make up stories, but they can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, Disgusting news.
Press Secretary Sarah Sanders was challenged yesterday to retract the president's comments, calling the media the enemy of the American people. She wouldn't do it. Sanders says President Trump, quote, has made his position known. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says North Korea is far from living up to its pledge to denuclearize. Speaking before an Asian security conference in Singapore, Pompeo said Pyongyang remains in violation of numerous UN security resolutions. His comments come one day after President Trump said he received a letter from Kim Jong-un, the communist nation's leader. At least 29 people are dead after a pair of suicide bombers attack a Shiite mosque in eastern Afghanistan. The strike came during Friday prayers. It injured 81 people, including five small children. No group has claimed responsibility, but the Islamic State has targeted Shiite worshipers in the past. Supporters of Zimbabwe's president celebrate after their candidate is re-elected. Emerson Munangagwa won a narrow victory with 50% of the vote, but opposition leaders call the results fake and fraudulent. It was the country's first election since longtime leader Robert Mugabe stepped down late last year under military pressure. Spain sets up a new government command center to help respond to the thousands of migrants arriving each month. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez made the announcement today. The surge of refugees is straining the country's public services. Sanchez also says he will speak with the governments of countries where the migrants are from. In the past two months, almost 15,000 refugees have been rescued in Spain's waters. Moscow claims a Russian woman arrested in the U.S. on charges of acting as an unregistered foreign agent is being mistreated in jail. A foreign ministry spokeswoman says Maria Butina is being kept in solitary confinement in a cold cell and her sleep is being interrupted. Russian officials are urging human rights groups to intervene. A Catholic diocese in Costa Rica sets up two centers to help people fleeing neighboring Nicaragua. They offer food and clothing. Since mid-April, more than 400 people have been killed in protests against Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega. A Catholic leader is speaking out against a pro-abortion proposal in Australia. Lawmakers in Queensland are considering a plan to legalize abortion up to 22 weeks. Archbishop Mark Coleridge of Brisbane asked Parliament to think of the mother and the unborn child. Abortion in the state currently is illegal. Coming up, Pope Francis releases his prayer intention for this month and an in-depth look at Robert Wilkie, the new Secretary of Veteran Affairs. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. In Tennessee, the race to fill outgoing Senator Bob Corker's seat is heating up. Former Governor Phil Bredesen, a Democrat, is running against Republican Congressman Marsha Blackburn. The winner is supposed to make history at the polls this November. This could be a campaign that changes the fate of our country. Democrat Phil Bredesen wants to be Tennessee's next senator. The last time a Democrat won a Senate seat in the state was 1990 with Al Gore. As mayor of Nashville, Bredesen opposed federal funding of abortion. The former governor has made no statement on the issue yet this year, but he has been endorsed by Planned Parenthood. Whether they're super conservative or super liberal or anywhere in between, they just they all say the same thing. Let's just move things. Let's get some things done. And um, that's very much the way I tried to operate as governor and very much what I want to bring, what I want to bring to Washington. His opponent, Republican Congressman Marsha Blackburn, would be the first woman elected to the Senate from Tennessee. And she believes her support for President Trump will put her ahead in the polls. We know that what Tennesseans say that they want to see in their next senator is somebody who is going to stand with President Trump yeah. to finish the agenda, finish the agenda that they voted for when they elected him and send him to Washington to drain the swamp. A fierce pro-life advocate, Blackburn led a 2016 House panel investigation into Planned Parenthood. I've worked directly with Marsha Blackburn. She's, uh, and I know her better, she is extremely skilled and articulate. She's prepared uh, to be uh, a senator. She has represented Tennessee extremely well. Joining us now is Anna Giratelli, a reporter for the Washington Examiner with more analysis. Anna, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Wyatt. Representative Blackburn is a supporter of President Trump, and Trump has attacked the former governor, saying he's too liberal for Tennessee. So how much of a factor will President Trump be in this election? 
I think President Trump's opinion in this and his endorsement of Marsha Blackburn is going to be huge because in the 2016 election, 60 percent of Tennessee voters went to Trump, 35 percent went to Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty big difference uh, in favor of President Trump. He hasn't been that loud yet for Marsha Blackburn. We still have three more months till the election. But I think his holding rallies in Tennessee, going there, um, even going out on Twitter and making some more commotion is, is going to help her because she is behind in the polls right now. Okay, so that's a big race we'll be watching in November. I want to turn to another issue that we've been covering, the trial that began this week for Paul Manafort, President Trump's former campaign chairman. Manafort's accused of tax evasion, bank fraud. Those charges are a result of Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. And President Trump earlier this week called on Attorney General Jeff Sessions to stop what he called a rigged witch hunt. How is all of this playing out in the public court? <laughs> There's a lot going on. So the trial just started this week in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Paul Manafort is facing up to 300 years in jail time for these offenses. He's accused of not uh, reporting f income overseas, which obviously a lot of federal offenses there. Um, but what this could be, you know, when it comes to the midterms is uh, Democrats are not saying the I word. They're not saying impeach Trump. Um, but they want to use this just as kind of starting to roll the ball and, and say, look, Trump's campaign chairman is, is probably guilty of all this. All of his other accomplices might be guilty of other stuff. Um, they're looking to take this, build momentum off it. And, you know, like we saw with James Comey, there might be an October surprise with the Mueller investigation. Well, let me follow up with you on that, because if the Mueller investigation continues through the midterm elections, do you think presidents, the president's harsh criticism will help or hurt other GOP candidates who are running for office? You know, I think that's something that re Republicans have to be especially careful about right now, because if they lean too close to Trump, then they're affiliated with uh, policies. Democrats are not so focused on the, uh, the, the case going on right now, the legal case against Manafort. They're looking at other very uh, emotional topics. Mm -hmm. So things like abolish ICE. That's been a real rallying cry for them. They're not really focused on their agenda. And I think what the president needs to do is say, you know, what is Democrats' plan forward? Focus on the economy and such things as that. And really stay away from reminding people, my friends are being investigated for stuff that happened two years ago. And we still don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Well, we're, there's a lot to follow and a lot for us to... to uh Keep pace on for the next three months. Anna Giratelli, Republic, a reporter for the Washington Examiner, thanks so much. Thanks, Wyatt. Up next, Pope Francis has a message for politicians. And these Franciscan brothers are here to serve on a special feast day. Hablar de las familias muchas veces me viene a la cabeza la imagen de un tesoro. Families this month. That's the Pope's prayer intention for the month of August. The Holy Father is asking us to pray for politicians to work to protect families, which he calls one of the treasures of humanity. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. President Trump's pick to lead the Department of Veterans Affairs is officially on the job. Robert Wilkie took the oath of office earlier this week. The former Pentagon official says he is humbled by the prospect of serving those who have borne the battle. Wilkie replaces former Secretary David Shulkin, who was fired amid ethics charges. Joining me now is Rebecca Burgess, Program Manager at the American Enterprise Institute's Program on American Citizenship, where she analyzes public policies intended to assist veterans and their families. Rebecca, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. As Secretary Wilkins swearing in, President Trump mentioned that our veterans deserve only the best, that they'll have it under Robert Wilkie. What does Secretary Wilkie now need to do to really to, to right the ship? Well, it's a very large ship. It's kind of like the Queen Mary, so it takes a long time to write it. And one of the things that he's going to do or need to do is to employ the full authority of an uh, act that Congress passed in 2017 that allows VA to hire um, a little bit more quickly uh, some of the staff that it needs. So VA is very understaffed um, from everything from uh, HR uh, physicians to doctors and nurses, of course, the most critical uh, front line of care. 
and Secretary Wilkie really needs to fill those uh, positions. He also needs to fill his own staff uh, that who has a vision uh, that can help him. Um, and one of those, one of the most important, is the Under Secretary of Health. Well, we really need that. Sure. Well, understaffing may sort of lead into my next point here because the Veterans Choice Program was supposed to reduce wait times for medical appointments no more than 30 days, but a GAO report released last month looking at the data from 2016 found veterans on average are still waiting anywhere from 51 to 64 days for medical appointments. How successful has that program really been and what do you think really needs to be done to get this? So track. part of this is a bureaucratic um, problem. Mm -hmm. The uh, VA suffers from a thickening of bureaucracy, which means that there are about 63 different levels of people that even a nurse has to go through to get authority to do something. That's 63 up, 63 back down, um, which is phenomenal, yeah, right? Um, try and try and come up with a decision, um, mm -hmm. you know, that um, makes sense to the person and the patient in front of you, right there. Mm -hmm. The other part of this is just the overall lack of um, healthcare providers in the U.S. healthcare system, um, and so there are mixed reports. You have some people who have um, benefited from the program and you have others who are still waiting. That is going to take Secretary uh, Wilkie and his staff to really figure out at the ground level um, and in the districts who is it that is making the decisions, identifying the people um, not only who need the care but then who can provide the care in a really safe and in a swift um, process. One of the issues facing the department is whether to expand veteran access to private sector health care providers. Secretary Wilkie has said he opposes privatization, but as a policy expert, what's your opinion? Would that help or hurt? I think it only helps veterans to allow them to have as much access to as many types of different care as possible. Um, and one of the reasons is that veterans are people too. They suffer from a, a just as many types of, of illnesses that we all do. Um, and of course, then they have specific ones, um, you know, whether it is um, m mental trauma, um, PTSD, things like that. And so we really need to be um, allowing them to seek the care um, that is specialized to their needs and to their, their, their way of healing, um, just the same that we need it ourselves. Well, this is an issue that affects yeah. so many of our veterans, and obviously it's one that we're going to continue to watch and cover. Rebecca Burgess, Program Manager at the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks so much for your analysis. Thank you. And finally tonight, Franciscans and volunteers in Peru prepare a meal for thousands of people. It's in honor of the Feast of the Portiluncula, or Little Chapel. The Franciscans celebrate it every August 2nd to honor a church rebuilt by St. Francis of Assisi. They make stew with donated ingredients, including beef, potatoes, and other vegetables. And I'm sure those who are less fortunate are thankful to the Franciscans for the warm stew. That wraps up our newscast for tonight. We thank you for watching. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We're back on Monday with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless. Thank you.